Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Stress Management for the Busy Professional. We're very excited to have you here this evening for this Think Innovate 2022 mini event. Um, I'm just going to cover the agenda real quick so you know what to expect. Uh, we're basically going to um, be talking a little bit about Think Innovate so you know what that is. And then we're going to jump into uh, the presentation for this evening on how to manage stress, uh, have a healthy lifestyle. And um, we're here with, with a very um, informed person on this topic. So very excited to hear about this. We'll open up the um, the session for Q&A around 5.15 and then at 5.30 we'll, we'll end the, the virtual event. Please feel free as the presentation is going on to put your questions in the chat or the Q&A box that's in the upper right hand corner of your screen. We'll be happy to take those questions as we're going along. So Innovate 2022, we're putting this on in October. We're very excited to put on this uh, technology operations and innovation executive event. And we have a few Ask the Experts. So whether you're attending our event or not, please feel free to take advantage of the Ask the Experts on the Innovate uh, website. We have Bill Atkinson from Atkinson Strate Strategic Communications. Uh, they unlock the voice of business through unparalleled guidance in public relations, strategic communications, and grassroots strategies. They're amazing at what they do. We actually work with them ourselves here at Think. We have Colleen uh, McKenna from Interro Advisory. She is a LinkedIn expert. So if you're looking to improve your LinkedIn brand um, or maybe even just need some tips on how to better network on that platform, you can take advantage of a free 25 minute session with her on how to improve your branding on LinkedIn. We also have Greg Stone from White for Tiller and Preston. Uh, Greg has over 25 years experience in patent and general intellectual property field and is available to answer your questions in that regard. He is the co-chair of the firm um, and also runs the technology group there. So he's very, very well informed and, and who doesn't have questions about intellectual property? It's a little bit confusing. And lastly, we have Dennis O'Donovan from Proficom. If you're uh, He's your technology vendor management expert. They help businesses find and manage the right technology vendors for telecom, data, IT, cloud solutions, and more. So if you're looking to save some money on those providers, or, or maybe you're just looking for a new one, Dennis can help you out with, with finding the right one. I want to take a moment just to thank all of our Think Innovate sponsors who made this event and all the future events that we'll be doing possible. Um, I hope that many of you that are on the call here today will consider coming to the Think Innovate conference in October. Uh, if you'd like to, you can register today by scanning the QR code that's on the screen. And we'll also be sending a, a follow-up email after this presentation if you'd like to learn more about the event. So without further ado, I'd like to in, uh, introduce our host, Igor. Uh, he's the CEO, CEO of Fitness Solutions Plus. And uh, Igor is the author of seven books in fitness, including Stop Exercising the Way You're Doing It Now. And anyone who was on the call today is going to be eligible for a free PDF download of that book. He also wrote The Mental Health Prescription and his bestseller, High Blood Pressure Reversal Secrets. He's also the CEO of Toronto's premier pers personal training companies, Fitness Solution Plus, and together with his team of fitness professionals, he specializes in helping busy professionals improve their fitness energy level and health. In the past, Igor has been hired to run fitness seminars for IBM, RBC, the American Express, and Qualcomm, along with other Fortune 500 companies. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Igor. Thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. Uh, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to share my screen and we will get started. Perfect. All right. If you guys can see my screen, um, well, I, I just unmute yourself quickly and just say yes. <laughs> or Laura, if you can see my screen, tell me yes. I can see it perfectly. It looks great. We just okay. need to go in slideshow mode. Perfect. <laughs> Let's get started. So thank you, everybody, for attending this presentation, Stress Management for the Busy Professional. Here's what we're going to cover today. First, I'll give you a bit of my background. So who am I and why am I pretending on this topic? And then we'll talk about how to fit exercise into your busy day, because often being busy and stressed go hand in hand. So how can you be stressed and still uh, maintain some kind of fitness routine? Uh, then we'll talk about how stress affects your body, not just in general, but different systems of your body from your immune system to your cardiovascular, to your nervous system and others. Finally, we'll talk about effective stress management strategies. Here, I'm going to list 12 of them. You might not need all 12, but it's nice to know that you have access to them, okay? So let's get started, my background. All throughout high school, I wanted to help people get stronger, leaner, lose body fat, have more energy, and so on. 
So as soon as I graduated, I started working as a personal trainer while concurrently pursuing my degree in kinesiology. Unfortunately, only about 25% of my clients were getting the results they wanted. Uh, frustrating for me, frustrating for them, considering I was implementing what was best practices in the industry at the time. So I started to incorporate nutrition into my practice. And no surprise when I combined exercise plus nutrition, results were better than either one by themselves. Now success rates went from 25% up to about 40%. So a lot better than they used to be, but it still meant that the majority of our clients were not getting the results they wanted. So at that point, I had a client who, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to call Menopausal Mary. <laughs> Menopausal Mary was doing everything right. She was eating right, she was exercising, and still having a hard time losing body fat. And the real interesting part is that up until the age of 48, she was a slim, trim, 130 pounds at five foot nine. Between 48 and 50, she gained 30 pounds, most of it around her waist. It seems like without any changes in exercise or nutrition. Real head scratcher. So I couldn't handle not getting good results with my clients. So I spent the next three years and $20,000 on top of my uh, university education studying about the connections between hormones and body fat, stress levels and body fat, digestion and body fat, all these things that are incredibly important, but unfortunately are not covered in degrees certifications, and so on. As a result, I was selected as, as one of the top five personal trainers in Toronto by the Metro News newspaper and eventually published a number of books. Uh, here's just a few. Stop Exercising, The Way You're Doing It Now, The Mental Health Prescription, High Blood Pressure Reversal Secrets, which turned out to be a best, uh, a best seller uh, on Amazon. And it has been it's about some publicity, including Globe and Mail, Health Executive Today, Toronto's major newspaper called Toronto Stars and others. And as Laura mentioned, if you guys want a free PDF version of the book, um, just visit this link. Um, sorry, I'm not sure why I glitched, but uh, but there, but yeah. So it's www.fitnesssolutionsplus.ca/think. Um, I've also been in, uh, been asked to be a guest expert on different TV programs, like this show, which is called "I'm Every Woman," and that specific episode was about the hormone body fat connection during menopause as well as um, this show, which is called CHCH Morning Live, and I was doing the book tour for the mental health book. And additionally, proceeds from past uh, presentations have been donated to different charities, including the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Ontario, the Alzheimer's Society of Region, and others. Now let's get to it. Fitting exercise into your busy day. Well, here's the thing. We often think that we don't have time, but here's something interesting. Barack Obama, as well as other presidents, except for uh, Donald Trump, um, Benjamin Franklin, Richard Branson, and others all found time to fit exercise into their busy day. Now, they could use the excuse of, I'm a busy politician, I'm a busy business person, I'm a busy uh, entrepreneur. They could use that excuse, but they choose not to. Why not? Because they know that if they take the their you know the 30 or 60 minutes out of their day for exercise, the rest of their day goes better. They think more clearly, they make better decisions, they sleep better, they have more energy, and so on. So it's really not a matter of time, it's a matter of priority. If it's not a high enough priority, it, it, it doesn't get done. If it's a high enough priority, it gets done. Something funny is that often when we talk to people who say they don't, they don't have time to exercise, we later find out that they do have time to watch American Idol or Friends or Netflix or something else. Uh, so again, not a matter of time, but a matter of priority. But let's say certain times of the year truly are extremely busy. You're working all day long. You have no leisure time. You're just uh, you're just grinding. How can you fit exercise into your busy day? Here are a few easy tips. One is if you live about a mile, a mile and a half away from work, you can walk to work. Um, a mile, mile and a half walk might take you somewhere about uh, 15 to 25 minutes, uh, one way and the other way. So there's your, uh, that, that gets you pretty close to your 10,000 steps. That probably gets you about six, six thousand, uh, six thousand, six and a half thousand steps throughout your day. If you live about five miles or less away from work, you can bike to work. A five mile bike ride might take you somewhere between the same amount of time, 15 to 25 minutes, depending on the speed, incline, and so on. Um, and that's another healthy way to fit exercise into your busy day. Um, if you're in a busy city with a uh, large metropolitan area and rush hour is already bad, like Los Angeles or Chicago or other places like that, um, and then, uh, and then it might take you the same amount of time anyways. I mean, I know in Toronto, if you take, whether you take the bike or you drive to work during rush hour, it'll be very, a very similar time. Um, here's another one. If 
you uh, watch TV with commercials uh, and you hate commercials, just do a few squats every time a commercial break comes on. Uh, now, if you don't have commercials, if you watch Netflix or Amazon Prime or something like that, uh, one thing you can do is um, every time you go to the washroom, you can do a few squats either before or after. Same thing with one legged deadlifts, which work the muscles of the hamstrings, the glutes, and the lower back, and push ups. All of these exercises don't require any equipment, but let's say you go to the washroom, eight, like an average person, eight to 16 times per day, and you spread it across these three exercises, that's pretty close to a full body workout, except that you divide it up across eight to 16 different segments. Not bad. So it doesn't really fatigue you. You don't need to go shower afterwards because you're not going to sweat from you know that short period of time. Um, so these are a few easy ways to fit exercise into your busy day. Now, also, a lot of people have this all or none mentality. Either I work out for one hour or I don't exercise at all. Well, a 30 minute workout is better than a zero minute workout. Uh, a five minute workout is better than a zero minute workout. So we don't have to think of either I do everything or I do nothing. If you do something, it's better than nothing. Okay. Uh, so these are a few easy ways to fit exercise into your busy day, including one mindset change from all or none to how much, how much exercise can I do today? Okay, now let's talk about how stress affects the, this, the, the different systems of your body. Um, but before we talk about stress, we have to differentiate between acute stress and chronic stress. Acute stress is a short-term stressor. Chronic stress is more ongoing. So here are a few differences, uh, different scenarios. An example of an acute stressor would be a job interview, a chronic uh, or, or a speeding ticket or competition. Um, like an athletic competition, interval training, um, public speaking, or having an argument, um, being cold. Um, these are all examples of acute stressors. Examples of chronic stressors would be things like poor sleep, bad relationships, bad work environment, job loss, financial stress, overtraining, and poor nutrition. These are all examples of chronic stressors. Here is hormonally how the body responds to an acute stressor. An acute stressor will, will spike up your cortisol levels uh, very sharply, and then once the stressor is over, you come back down to normal levels. For example, um, exercise, especially cardio, is an acute stressor. That's not bad. It's not good. It's just a characteristic of it. It's a physical stressor, maybe not mental or emotional. Uh, when you do cardio, cortisol spikes, which is a good thing, by the way, um, and then cortisol declines, and then you know it, it goes on normally. When you have an argument, cortisol spikes and then declines. Now, this one is a bit more variable than cardio because if an, if an argument is resolved, it declines. If an argument is unresolved, it can, it can turn acute into chronic. But these are just examples of the hormonal response to an acute stressor, okay? In chronic stress, it's a, it's a little bit different. Chronic stress is stress that is ongoing. And here's what happens initially. At first, you have pretty normal cortisol levels. Throughout the alarm stage, that's when the stressor hits you, um, you have a small dip in your cortisol before your body mounts a response to it, and you start producing more and more and more cortisol until you hit the resistance stage. That is if stress has been going on for somewhere between days and weeks. Um, it also depends on the strength of your system. Um, is it resolved? Is it not resolved, et cetera? Um, and now what we always think of stress of, of cortisol as a stress hormone, but it's not a bad hormone. What does cortisol do for us? Cortisol does, has a lot of beneficial effects in the body. It's anti-inflammatory, um, which means that, for example, if, you know, our bodies are wired for a world that's 40,000 years old. So a, a stressor back then would be either fighting saber tooth tigers or famines. And so if you were fighting a saber tooth tiger and it slashed you, you want to be, you want anti-inflammatory. You don't want to get inflamed if you, if, if, if that happens. Um, so that's a beneficial effect. Uh, and there are many other beneficial effects to cortisol when it's in short, uh, in short bursts. In other words, you exercise, cortisol spikes, cortisol declines. Um, cortisol becomes problematic when it's a chronic stressor. Cortisol was not meant to stay high for weeks or months on end. But Again, cortisol at first dips and then rises, rises, rises. Once cortisol has been high for a matter of weeks or months, it starts to decline and you get um, well into the, the exhaustion stage. Okay, this is a very old model from a, from a scientist named Hans Selye, and it's called the general adaptation syndrome. Okay, uh, so that's what chronic stress looks like hormonally from a cortisol perspective. Now, 
how does chronic stress affect your thyroid? And first of all, what is the thyroid? The thyroid is a butterfly-shaped gland that sits in front of the windpipe, and it controls things like your metabolism. It's the master metabolism controller in the body. And so chronic stress actually decreases thyroid function. So if you start to get cold when you're under stress, um, if you start to, to crave more food when you're under stress, well, that's the reason why, because of the slowing down of the thyroid. Now, here are some symptoms of a slow thyroid. How might you know if you have it? Here are a few examples. One is if you have cold hands and feet when other people around you are comfortable. Two is if you're tired all the time. Three is if you're constipated because the, the bowels aren't moving. And four, if you have, sorry, I'm not sure why the glitch here, if you have thinning of the outer third of your eyebrow, okay? These are all symptoms of a slow thyroid. There are others, but these are the hallmarks of a slow thyroid, okay? Um, what about your blood sugar under chronic stress? Um, you think blood sugar rises simply um, and solely in response to what you eat, but that's not the case. Blood sugar also rises in response to chronic stress. Any diabetic who regularly measures their blood glucose will know that without eating, they might have a different reading between uh, the, the after they have their meal and when they wake up eight plus hours later. Why might that be? Well, cortisol. That's, uh, that's the culprit behind high blood sugar during uh, times of stress. Um, what does cortisol do? Cortisol raises the blood sugar. It's what's called a glucocorticoid. Why does it raise the blood sugar? Because again, our body is wired for a world that's 40,000 years old. Uh, again, the only two stressors we had 40,000 years ago was uh, either fleeing or fighting saber-toothed tigers and famines. Now, sugar is fuel. So if you, if you are going to either fight or flee a saber-toothed tiger, you need fuel to do those. Like if you're just sitting at your desk worrying about deadlines or finances or relationships, blood sugar is still elevated, but it's not really going in your muscles. It's just staying in your blood. Um, that's just how cortisol affects your blood sugar. Never mind how stress causes your craving, uh, like, uh, triggers cravings, which we'll address in, in, a, in a second. Um, another one is constipation. That's another uh, a potential negative effect of chronic stress. Why is there constipation? Well, again, let's think back to a world that's 40,000 years old. If you have to run or you have to flee, this is not this is no time to process food. So the, the, the digestive process gets put on hold until the stressor is over and then it hopefully normalizes. That's what a key, that, that's with an acute stressor. With a chronic stressor, it may not normalize even after the stressor is over, although that is a prerequisite to, towards normalization. Uh, you may need uh, other interventions to normalize you know, bowel function, uh, but that's one uh, potential uh, consequence of chronic stress, okay? Another potential consequence is diarrhea. So, and it's a bit paradoxical that you can have both responses to chronic stress, but here's why you can get diarrhea. And think about it this way, if you have to run from a saber tooth tiger, you wanna make yourself light. Why of making yourself light is evacuating your bowels. <laughs> um, Short-term solution. But again, um, if the stressor is chronic, then this, this could happen, okay? The immune system. The immune system consists of a bunch of different cells, uh, both the patrols as well as the, the actual armed guards um, who will uh, handle when an, an quote-unquote intruder uh, comes in. Uh, and then what happens during stress is your immune system is actually strengthened. It's rarely during the, during the time of stress when you catch colds or the flu or something else. It's usually after a stressor is over and you can relax. You mentally, emotionally relax. Cortisol comes down, but again, cortisol actually strengthens the immune system uh, temporarily. And if you do it, and if you have cortisol in the right amounts at the right times, now once cortisol comes down to what uh, what we think is normal levels, uh, the immune system starts to get weaker, and that's when you're most prone towards colds, um, the colds, the flu, and to a great extent cancer. Um, a, a huge risk for cancer is lifetime stress exposure. Okay. Another one is the reproductive system. Um, again, think back to our world that's 40,000 years ago. If you're either running away from the saber tooth tiger or you're fighting it, or you're worried about collecting foods to escape a famine, to live through a famine, this is no time to make babies. Uh, this is no time to worry about your reproduction because there are higher priority things evolutionarily that you have to attend. And that's why often there are problems with the reproductive system under chronic stress, both in men and women. And the circulatory system. Um, stressor, uh, stressors are a huge risk factor for uh, cardiovascular disease. 
things like blood clots, which could cause heart attacks, which could cause strokes. Why would that be? Well, let's go back to our to our 40,000 year old world. If we are fighting a saber tooth tiger and it slashes us, we don't want to bleed to death. We want to claw it eventually so that we don't bleed to death. Uh, very advantageous if you're, if you're bleeding, not that advantageous if you're not bleeding, if you're just sitting at your desk and you know constantly worrying. Um, and so that's one very strong reason why you want to clot, okay? Um, when you're bleeding, when you, uh, if you're not bleeding, you don't want to clot on the inside because it can block, uh, it's basically creating a dam um, of blood flow. And if the dam is not broken via, uh, you know, medications, exercise, nutrition, uh, surgery, then that can, that can cause problems with both the heart and the brain and other organs. Okay. Memory. Um, the brain is one of the most uh, stress sensitive organs, but the brain is, is very multifunctional. There's one small part of the brain that's specifically responsible for memory. That part is called the hippocampus. The hippocampus, what it does is it converts short-term memory into long-term memory. So if you're the kind of person who under stress, you walk into a room and you forgot what you wanted to get out of that room, or you open your refrigerator and you forgot what you wanted to get out of the fridge, or you forgot where you left your car case or you parked your car. These are all examples of chronic stress playing games with your memory. The There are more receptors for cortisol on your hippocampus than any other part of your body. More receptors than your than your heart, more receptors than your brain, uh, than other parts of your brain, more receptors than your joints and so on, okay? Um, and so memory is definitely affected by chronic stress. Now let's talk about how chronic stress affects fat loss. Um, for some people, what happens is they gain weight. And one reason they gain weight is cravings. Uh, this is obvious. If you don't have, um, if, if you have chronic stress, it can drain a lot of your energy. You need energy, so you're going to, you're going to crave stuff. And you're not exactly craving spinach and broccoli. You're craving Big Macs. You're craving greasy stuff. You're craving starchy stuff. Um, and so that's one reason why stress can, uh, it can, can increase your cravings. Um, and what, what is it about stress physiologically or biochemically that can increase your cravings? Well, stress depletes what's called a neurotransmitter known as serotonin. Serotonin is the neurotransmitter that makes you feel com uh, content, calm, etc. Now, if you don't have enough of it, you could increase it with food, primarily uh, sugars, starches, sweets, stuff like that. And so although it's good for your serotonin levels, it's not that great for your waistline. There are other ways to stimulate serotonin, like stress reduction, which we'll cover in a few minutes. Um, so this is how, this, these are a few examples of how chronic stress can affect fat loss. One more is the thyroid. Remember cortisol and thyroid um, are, are kind of, are, are related to each other. The higher the cortisol, the slower the thyroid. And so that could decrease your, your, um, your, your, your fat burning, your metabolism. How does that work? Remember, the thyroid is a master hormone regulator. So there are four possible sources of energy expenditure. So all the calories you burn throughout the day add up to these four sources. And here they are. On the leftmost is something called BMR, which stands for basal metabolic rate. That's what they call your coma calories. How many calories would it take just to keep you alive? And these numbers, by the way, are purely hypothetical. Um, the, the proportions are pretty much, are pretty on track, but the actual numbers are hypothetical. Then, next, you have something called NEAT, N-E-A-T, which stands for non-exercise activity thermogenesis. These are all things that are movements but are not formal exercise. For example, some people like gardening. Gardening is not exercise, but it does burn calories. Some people, maybe some of you, are sitting there and bouncing your ankle. That burns a few calories. Uh, these are all examples of movements that are not formal exercise, but still burn calories. And this, the NEAT, is the real wild card when it comes to fat loss, um, muscle loss, etc. For some people, it's very low. For some people, it's very high. And the thing is, it's very, very difficult to measure. After all, you can measure the metabolism to measure calories burned during exercise. But how, you, how do you measure things like ankle bouncing? How do you measure all these little things? That's the tough one. So it's really a measurement of exclusion. So if somebody knows the BMR and somebody knows exercise and TEF, which I'll elaborate on in a second, they can figure out the NEAT. But next exercise, I don't think I have to talk about that one too much. If you exercise, you burn calories, not, not, not uh, terribly new or terribly controversial. And the last one is something called TEF. That stands for uh, thermic effect of food. Thermic effect of food. What does that mean? Whenever we eat food, 
we don't absorb 100% of the calories. We absorb about 90% of the calories, depending on the composition of our meals. Um, and so if you do eat 2000 calories per day, you'll spend about 200 of those calories absorbing, digesting and assimilating the food you just ate. So these are the four possible sources of energy expenditure. Why do I elaborate on that? That's because how we're talking about how stress affects the thyroid and therefore thyroid affects your calorie burn. So this is a hypothetical example of somebody with a healthy thyroid. Here's an example of somebody under stress who has a slow thyroid. Here's what that might look like. Here is what they look like. So here's a healthy thyroid on the left, and here is a slow thyroid on the right. So their metabolism might go from 900 calories per day to 850, okay? But here's the big drop. Their meat might go down because they're feeling sluggish. Instead of burning 500 calories per day, they might now, now might be burning 350, okay? Everything else might stay the same. The exercise might stay the same. Thermic effect of food might stay the same, but there's a small drop in metabolism and a large drop in meat. Because if you're feeling sluggish, if you're not energetic, all these small involuntary movements start to go away. And again, it's hard to measure. Um, again, this is hypothetical. I'm not saying there's going to be a 10% drop with a slow thyroid, but here's what we do know. The thyroid regulates body temperature and every degree Celsius that you're below optimal, uh, you're burning between 10 and 13% fewer calories than if you had that. So if you're two degrees under, that means you're burning uh, 200 to 260 calories per day fewer than if you had a well a properly working thyroid. Okay, so that's another example of how chronic stress affects fat loss by slowing down the thyroid. So you might be eating the same amount of calories as you know you've always been eating, but you're now spending less because a your metabolism is slower, but b you're not moving around involuntarily as much. Okay, another way that chronic stress affects fat loss is simply a decreased physical activity. Um, if you're tired, uh, if you're stressed, often that's because of a lot of things on your plate. If there's a lot of things on your plate, usually exercise tends to fall by the wayside, but not even just exercise, but also things that are not formal exercise, like, as I mentioned earlier, gardening, going out for walks, hiking, stuff like that. Not formal exercise, but it falls by the wayside. Um, either logistically, because you have the energy, you just don't have the time, or two, you don't have the energy. And if you do work out, maybe there's less effort during the workouts. Maybe you're not going to do to do the to do the extra reps or the extra minutes, or you decrease the speed, or something in the in the workout suffers that you don't burn as many calories as when you're not under stress. So these are a few examples of how chronic stress affects fat loss. Um, now, what about muscle gain? How does chronic stress affect that? Well, here's what it takes to grow muscle, and I think of it as, as pouring water into a bucket versus there is a leak in the bucket. Uh, you can pour water into the bucket, but there, if there are if there is a leak in the bucket, what's the net effect? Is there a water gain, a water loss, or water maintenance? Um, and here, here's how I think about it. The water going into the bucket is the things required to build muscle. And it's really basically three or four things. One, good sleep. Two, strength training. Three, adequate protein. Um, it's usually pretty much as simple as that. If I was to include a fourth, maybe it's adequate hormone levels, testosterone in, in, in men and estrogen and testosterone in women. That's the thing, that's the water going into the bucket. But also there are leaks in the bucket. And what are the leaks that could be preventing you from gaining muscle? The leaks could be things like inadequate protein. It could be things like excessive long duration cardio. And it could be things like high cortisol levels. Cortisol breaks down muscle and turns it into sugar. Now, if you're under chronic stress, you might be sleeping well, although you might not be. Um, you might not be eating the right foods. You might not be strength training. So though the water going into the bucket has been has gone from you know a lot of water to maybe just a, just a trickle, but the water coming out of the bucket might be way greater. Okay, um, so that's another way which uh, through which uh, chronic stress can affect your muscle gain. So it can decrease the amount of muscle you gain um, compared to if you're not under stress. Another one is testosterone. When so cortisol and testosterone are antagonistic to each other. In other words, when cortisol is high, testosterone is low, and it happens because of well, here's a set, a simplified version of what's called a, of what's called the pregnenolone steel pathway. Both, if you look over here, testosterone below androstenedione dione and cortisol actually come from the same mother mother molecule, which is cholesterol. So it can either go one way. You can either go the path can either take this direction to the left. Or can take this direction to the right and there's not enough pregnenolone to supply both adequately okay so if cortisol is high usually testosterone is low so so is estrogen okay uh, because estrogen is made from testosterone okay and that's the mechanism by which um, chronic stress 
could deplete your testosterone levels. Another one is frequent colds. Obviously, if you have a cold, you don't feel like exercising, nor should you go exercising not to infect other people, okay? Um, and slower recovery. When you're under stress, your body is fighting that stressor, whether, whether it's a mental, mental, emotional stressor or a physical stressor. Um, and sometimes mental, emotional stressors become physical stressors. Maybe you don't sleep well, maybe you feel hot, maybe you feel cold, etc. So if your body is fighting uh, whatever it perceives to be a physical or mental, emotional stressor, it's not going to have the same recovery to recover from workouts. So maybe it'll take you from uh, four strength training sessions per week to three strength training sessions per week. And of course, you make better progress with four strength training sessions than three strength training sessions. Um, these are all examples of how chronic stress affects muscle gain, slower recovery. Now that we've talked about the various different uh, ways through which uh, stress affects your body, we've talked about how chronic stress affects fat loss and muscle gain, let's talk about the solutions. What are some effective stress management strategies? I'm going to give you 12. One strategy is to punch something. Now, I did say something, not someone, okay? So big distinction here. <laughs> um, so why does this work? Because again, think back to our you know 40,000-year-old physiology. Uh, we're meant to either fight or flee, okay? And why? Because all the physiological adaptations of chronic stress prepare you for fighting or fleeing. Blood pressure goes up because you have to pump blood out to the periphery. Blood sugar goes up because you need to provide fuel to working muscles. But if you're just sitting at your desk, that blood pressure and blood sugar isn't really doing you much good. But if you're physical, if you punch something, you're actually using the sugar and the pressure to do what your body was meant to do under stress. You fight or flee. You need something physical and something intense. Okay. Another one is sleep. Good, restful sleep really, really, really helps with stress management. But it's a bit of a cash 22. Some of you might be thinking, well, Igor, I'm stressed, so I can't sleep. And I can't sleep, so I'm stressed. So how do you break out of that vicious cycle? Here are a few ways to improve your sleep. Let's start with the bare basics first. One, total darkness. <laughs> um, you want to sleep in complete darkness. So no moonlight, no street lights, uh, no, no electronics in the bedroom, nothing that could emit light on your skin or your body. Why is that? It's not just because it's comfortable, it's also because of melatonin receptors. We have melatonin receptors not just in our eyes, but in also other parts of our body. So you could literally uh, wake someone up by shining a flashlight at their feet. Now, don't try this on your spouse and then blame me, but as a fun experiment, if you want to, to do it, you could, okay? Um, so the bare basics at first, total darkness. Second, as I mentioned earlier, but it bears repeating, no electronics in the bedroom. Um, or at the very least, if you have to have electronics, make sure they're far enough away that you have to actually put your feet on the ground to reach them. So you shouldn't be able to reach them while you're still lying in bed, okay? Um, it could interfere with brain waves, and we have the brain waves of deep sleep, which is which are called theta waves, um, and that's what provides you with restorative sleep. If you don't get deep sleep, you wake up, you might have slept eight hours, but you're not feeling well rested. Another one is temperature. This one is key. So you want the temperature to be low enough to be comfortable. What's low enough temperature? It's usually somewhere in the mid to high 60s. That's good temperature for sleeping. Why? Because throughout, uh, throughout sleep, the body naturally has fluctuations in temperature and your temperature hits a low point somewhere around 1, 2, or 3 a.m. Around that time, you should hit a low point. Now, if the outside temperature is high, you can't hit that low point so you don't go into the deepest stages of sleep, so it's not that restorative, okay? If the basics aren't addressed, don't worry about the fancy stuff. Speaking of the fancy stuff, let's hypothetically say your basics are addressed and you're still not sleeping well. What can you do to sleep better? Well, here's the fancy stuff. One, what you see on here is what's called blue light blocking glasses. They're pretty ugly looking glasses that you can get, you know, that you can get anywhere, or Amazon or whatever, um, and put them on. Now, what is blue light? Well, the spectrum of light that's visible to our eyes um, has a number of different lights. It's essentially the rainbow. Um, and there's different lights for different things. There is blue light, which keeps us awake. That's great in the morning, not so good when it's time to go to bed um, or in the hours before bed. It's generally recommended that people put on blue, uh, blue light blocking glasses um, as they're approaching bedtime, okay? Um, now, a lot of computers and phones that are, let's say, more than, uh, or sort of less than three years old, they have natural settings that will say block blue light after X amount of time or after sunset, depending on where you are in the, in the world or in the country. Um, 
Now you have those settings, but you don't have those settings necessarily on your own lights in the office, in the bedroom, et cetera. And so that's where blue light blocking glasses come in and they're handy um, to block the lights that your phone and your computer don't block. Okay. Next is magnesium. Um, handy little supplement. Um, I like to approach uh, things from a nutritional perspective first before using hormones like melatonin. Um, magnesium is a mineral that helps you relax. And there are many different forms of magnesium with different forms for different issues. Uh, you might walk into a health food store and see a million kinds of magnesium, magnesium oxide, magnesium chloride, magnesium glycinate, and others. What's the right kind? Well, like I said, different types for different issues. But the right type for brain and muscles, which is what you, what you want for sleep, is called magnesium glycinate or magnesium bisglycinate. They're both basically the same thing, spelled G L Y. C-I-N-A-T-E. Magnesium glycinate is what you want for sleep. And again, different diets for different things. Now, if magnesium hasn't worked, then you go for melatonin. This is what I call the, not heavy artillery, but medium artillery. Heavy artillery is what I would call like prescription drugs. But melatonin, you can get over the counter. Um, and the, these two, magnesium, sorry, magnesium and melatonin, um, help with sleep tremendously, okay? Uh, but I wouldn't use both concurrently. Uh, I would give magnesium a fair shot of something like uh, one to two weeks. If it hasn't, um, if it hasn't put you to sleep in that period of time, try something you know more stronger like melatonin. Okay. Now, besides that, strategy number three is massage. Massage is very relaxing. It does lower cortisol and chronically stressed out individuals. Um, and there are certain receptors in the skin that deep touch can help stimulate to actually downgrade what the brain perceives. So you might you might be worried in your head, but once those receptors in the skin are stimulated, uh, the body starts to relax. Another one is the three breath interrupt. This is one of my favorites uh, because it takes very little time and it's effective and you can do it anywhere. So what is the three breath interrupt? The three breath interrupt is this. All you do simply is take three slow breaths. They don't have to be deep breaths. They have to be slow breaths. Um, why? Well, let's think back to a 40,000 year old physiology. If you're going to fight or flee, you, you've got to breathe fast. Why? Because you've got to get enough air in to supply working muscles. Uh, again, great when you're fighting or fleeing and not so good when you're sitting at your, uh, at your table worrying. A normal breathing rate, a normal respiration rate is 12 breaths per minute or less. An ideal respiration rate is between five and six breaths per minute. Okay. Anything above 12 is at least low grade hyperventilation. And then beyond a certain point, it's straight up hyperventilation. Now you might not notice this, but when you're under stress, you breathe faster. If somebody was to watch you when you're not aware that they're watching you and they were to count your breathing, you'd find it's probably between 16 and 25 breaths per minute. That's too frequent. If you're not exercising, if you're not running, if you're not fighting. Now, fortunately, breathing is the only part of the nervous system that you can control both voluntarily and involuntarily. And so if involuntarily your, your body tells you to breathe, you know, 18 times per minute, you can voluntarily hijack that positively and calm yourself down by breathing slower. What you might find is that as a result of slower breathing, your thoughts come along for the ride. Sometimes thoughts determine behaviors. So I'm stressed, therefore I'm breathing fast. But sometimes the opposite is true as well. You can, behaviors can also affect your thoughts. You can, you can work at it, at it the other way as well, backwards. So you can be stressed, but start voluntarily breathing slowly and then be less stressed. Nothing about the situation has changed, but it's less stressful because you're able to breathe slower. And again, I want to emphasize, this is not about deep breathing. This is about slow breathing. It's the tempo. It's not the depth. Okay. Exercise. Uh, this one is very, very obvious because um, again, a lot of the adaptations of stress are meant for fighting or fleeing. So again, blood pressure rises. Why does it rise? To pump blood harder to working muscles. Why does blood sugar rise? To give fuel to working muscles. Now, if blood pressure um, and blood sugar rise in preparation for activity, well, give it activity. Give the pressure, uh, give the blood pressure somewhere to pump the blood. Give the sugar somewhere to go instead of staying in the blood. So exercise is a very healthy way to deal with uh, with chronic stress. Another one is to identify the stressor. This one's more on the psychological side of things. But very often we're stressed and we're not quite sure why we're stressed. Sometimes, yeah, there's an outright situation. We know what's stressing us out. Sometimes we're just stressed and we don't know why. 
But if you can name what's stressing you out, it gives it a shape. It makes it less amorphous and more morphous. So you know exactly what's stressing you out. It's not, and even if you don't do anything about it, um, then you can, just knowing what's stressing you out and giving it a label, that can decrease your stress. But even more so, you can make a plan. Once you've identified it, what can you do with it? Now that it has a shape, form, et cetera, what can you do with that stressor? What, what are some different solutions to whatever is stressing you out? You can brainstorm, you can get help from colleagues, spouses, um, et cetera. Another one is what can you control? So one thing that often helps people who are under stress is they often worry about things that they can control. Um, and in, in the words of Robert De Niro, forget about it if you can't control it, okay? Um, and so really focus on what you can't control. Okay. What is it within the situation? Maybe there's a lot of things that are outside of control, but what is it within, within control that you can focus on? And if you can't control it, how do you control it? This goes back to making a plan. Okay. Next is one, one great uh, strategy is just asking yourself, what's the worst that could happen? A lot of people who are what I call worry warts, um, they think to the worst case, uh, the, to the worst case scenario, which is not really a realistic case scenario, but it's the worst case scenario. If you just think to yourself, what's the worst case that could happen? And if you think to yourself, oh, even the worst case scenario is not that bad, that takes a lot of the edge off of that. Now, this is even more powerful to do if you actually write it down and really think about it, okay? I get that when you're under stress, you're just thinking about, you know, just take the next step, just move forward, move forward, move forward. But if you take a small step back and take 30 seconds to think what's, what's the realistic worst case scenario, and it's not that bad, it takes the edge off. Another one is punctuality. So there's a lot of things that you can control. And again, one of the strategies is looking for what you can control. But the one thing that you can, that you can control is how early you are, okay? Um, there's a saying that if you're on time, you're late. <laughs> um, and so if one thing that often worries you is just arriving late for a very important meeting, simply leave, leave earlier. Um, maybe there's construction. Maybe there is an accident. Uh, you never know. So just leaving earlier with enough of a time gap uh, that helps a lot with stress uh, with stress strategies. Um, one of my most successful clients in terms of stress management, uh, they, they often say that I would rather be an hour early than a minute late. Another one is looking for the positive. There may be a lot of bad situations out there. There may be a lot of terrible things going on, but a lot of terrible things also have a small sliver of something positive. I'll give you an example. Um, for a lot of industries, COVID was not a good thing. Okay. Uh, a lot, a bunch of people lost their jobs. A lot of, a bunch of people lost a lot of money. Now, granted there were industries that did really well, like pharmaceuticals, logistics, telecommunications, and so on. Um, but if you were on the side affected negatively, one of which one of my clients did is she said, I got to spend more time with my kids and this pandemic has given me a chance to get closer to my kids, uh, a positive spin on a negative situation. And another one is distraction. Okay. This is my last stress management. Uh, tip, which is simply distraction. So what's distracting to you? Maybe uh, you're, you're, you're constantly caught in your own head and you're thinking about the stressor. So what's distracting to you? Does going for a walk clear your head or does going for a walk make you think about it more? Okay. Because uh, not two people are the same and you have, you have to identify what's effective to you. Does exercise work for you or does exercise uh, get your mind to go to whatever's stressing you out? So what about doing a puzzle? So you have to identify what's distracting to you in a positive way um, and do that. And so these are 12 different stress management strategies that you can use. Um, you can use one of them, you can use all of them, you can use some of them. Um, and this brings me to the end of my presentation. A lot of these strategies I talk about in my book, um, chapter seven called Stop Exercising the Way You Are Doing It Now. If any of you guys want a free PDF version of the book, go to the link in this uh, on the slide, fitnesssolutionsplus.ca slash think. And with this conclusion of our presentation, I'll either pass it back to Laura or open it up for questions. Okay, so uh, let's just go ahead and open up the floor to questions. You can either um, put them in the Q&A or post them in the chat. Um, I have a question. Yes. So I've been, you know, obviously, you know, we're putting on our first annual conference this year. It's a little bit stressful on top of everything yep. else. Um, what about like diet? Like when it comes to, like I've been trying this macro thing. Does, does yep. diet play a role in stress reduction and, and just overall health, you know, in terms of, um, reducing some of those hormones and the cortisol and, and stuff like that. 
Yeah, unquestionably. There's no question that eating a healthy diet um, improves overall health. Now, the real question is, what is a healthy diet? And the thing is, there's no one healthy diet. Um, there are many diets that could be healthy. Um, I mean, one thing that's very trendy right now is the keto diet. Before that, it was the paleo diet. Um, there's many different diets. Um, and I once wrote an article called what is a healthy diet? And ultimately there is the answer is there's many healthy diets. And, you know, the, if somebody asked me is fill in the blank, a healthy food, um, or is this an unhealthy food? Um, I have another presentation that I do called healthy foods that poison, why are getting sicker and fatter despite eating healthier? And the overall message is this, there's no such thing as a globally healthy food or a globally unhealthy food. For example, we think of broccoli as a picture of health food, correct? Um, well, broccoli is not healthy if you have a slow thyroid, okay? Mm -hmm. Spinach, we think of that as a picture of health food, correct? But spinach is not so healthy if you have low iron, okay? Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we always think of like sugar as being terrible for you. And it is the majority of the time. However, if somebody is a diabetic and they're about to go into a coma, if they're having a hypoglycemic episode, this is not the time for salad. This is the time to bring the blood sugar up ASAP. Sugar does that better than broccoli. Um, so yeah, there is, so does a healthy diet play, play a role in stress management? Absolutely. What is a healthy diet? There are many healthy diets. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. And, you know, it's really interesting to hear you say, uh, you know, the broccoli and spinach, because I would have never thought, you know, to even think about, you know, the fact that spinach, if you have low iron would be, you know, a problem or, you know, the yeah. thing with thyroidism. So yeah. that's really good to think about the fact that, you know, we have to be conscious of what foods we're eating, because perhaps it may, you know, impact something else that's going on within our own uh, individual bodies and yeah, for nutrition. Absolutely. There's a saying that one man's food is another man's poison. And it's absolutely true. Just because a good food is good in general, doesn't mean it's good for all people all the time. Good, good point. Good point. Um, another, another question I just kind of had um, related to kind of memory and, you know, the thing that you were talking about, like kind of getting a, a clotted head, like when you have stress and chronic stress, um, are there, is, is there any truth to playing those games, like the, the mind games and the, um, you know, the, the puzzles and different things, Sudoku or whatever, like, does, is that, is there any proof in the pudding that, that those things can help reduce stress? Um, I don't think it can help reduce stress, but can they enhance memory? Yes. Um, now remember memory starts to go when you're under stress. So if you're starting from a higher point, you lose less of your memory when you're under stress. Um, often when the stressor is over, you regain your memory, but you might've lost a little bit um, while you were under stress. So yeah, things like mental puzzles absolutely work. Um, but it's also important to stimulate different parts of the brain. Mental puzzles might, might work the left side of the brain, but you also want to work the right side of the brain. So with creative activities, um, learning new languages, looking at patterns, trying to identify patterns, stuff like that. But also there's the biochemical side of memory. Um, two nutrients that are highly responsible for memory are vitamin B12 uh, and folic acid. And so I'll throw a third one in there, B6. Um, so if somebody's under stress, the body, the body's requirements for those nutrients start to rise. Either you can eat more of them in food, um, or you can take a, a, a supplement with a B complex. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Thank, thank you. That, that's very helpful. Those were kind of my two questions. Zoe, did you have any questions? I, I know that you were very excited for this session as well. <laughs> I think she might be on mute. <laughs> Sorry, it was, it was uh, muting and unmuting. Um, I actually did post one in the Q&A, uh, but I am happy to say it as well. Um, so I wanted to expand a little bit on um, what uh, Laura had asked. So how can you find out what foods are healthy for you, depending on your own body and your own health? So like if you have low iron, if you are diabetic, like we talked about uh, before the presentation, how a lot of people just don't know those things about their bodies. Are there yeah. are things that... Uh, healthy food is or isn't working for you? Yeah. Uh, how much time do you have, Zoe? Um, so not you, long. <laughs> no, I know. Um, sorry, I'm just, uh, I'm not familiar with the software, so I'm trying to go back and see the chat box. Um, but anyways, to answer your question, how do you find out which foods are good for you or bad for you? Uh, there's a number of different ways. There is what I call the high-tech way and the low-tech way. Um, Despite the low tech being low tech, it's actually the gold standard. And the low tech way is something called an elimination diet, which means that for a period of somewhere between two and four weeks, you either run a food sensitivity test or you eliminate 
the most common food sensitivities in North America. So things like gluten, dairy, um, eggs, sugar, and its derivatives, um, as well as um, gluten, dairy, um, sugar, eggs. And um, there's one more that I'm forgetting about right now, but you eliminate those, those five at first. And then after the two to four week elimination period, you start reintroducing them one by one every three days or so. And as you're introducing them, you're paying attention to your symptoms. And there's a few symptoms that I tell people to pay attention to. Uh, one, bowel movements. Are there any changes to the bowel movements um, when you re re reintroduce a certain food? Two, skin quality. Does the skin get either dry or oily when you're reintroducing certain food? Uh, three, nasal congestion. Do you start to get congested when you reintroduce a certain food? Uh, four, joint stiffness. Do your joints get stiff when you re reintroduce a certain food? Um, and five, mood. Do you have significant changes in mood that cannot be attributed to situational factors um, as a result of reintroducing a certain food? Um, these are the factors that tell people to consider when it comes to um, identifying what's good for them and what's bad for them. That's the low tech way, but despite that, that's actually the gold standard. The high tech way um, is running a laboratory test for food sensitivities. Now, there are many different lab tests out there. Um, the most accurate one is the one that tests various food sensitivities. So the traditional food sensitivity testing is called IgG testing, but traditional does not mean necessarily 100% accurate. The, the most accurate high-tech method is the one that combines different forms of immune testing, which is not just IgG, but also IgA and IgM. Uh, this doesn't require any elimination, um, and it is re relatively accurate, but again, but not as accurate as the low-tech method. So that's kind of how you would identify what's good for you, what's bad for you. Having said that, let's say you do reintroduce something and you find out that it doesn't work for you. That's then they, you, you can classify that as a sensitivity. What complicates the picture is that sensitivities are not are not 100% fixed. Some of them, yes, they're fixed and they're a sensitivity from birth to death. Other sensitivities are cyclical which means that you might be sensitive to it now, but if you were to retest yourself in six months, it might not, no longer be a sensitivity. Uh, so this, you know, for people who are really, really dedicated and they really wanna test this out, they can run the, either the elimination diet or lab testing once every six to 12 months or so. Does that answer your question? Definitely, definitely, yeah. Perfect. Good, good, good. Any others? Yes, we have oh. a, a question from Jennifer Greenjack. Um, out of those 12 suggestions that you provided, which would, uh, which would you say are the top three? It makes it seem more attainable and not so stressing, no pun intended, to do it all. Yeah, um, Jennifer, great question. Um, the ones that I recommend are the ones that you think are easiest to do. Uh, um, there is, this, is this is highly personal. Uh, it depends on how do you respond to stress. Are you the type of that gets forgetful? Or is your memory fine or do you catch colds? So there's different ways of dealing with stress. So I would throw the question back to you and which... which Three, do you think it would work for you the best? You can feel free to answer or just think about it. Like the, I'll tell you the ones that I like to use, but again, that's that's what works for me, my mental, you know, um, makeup, etc. Um, I personally like to a think of a plan, uh, be punctual, and exercise. Those are my three favorites. I use others, but these are my three favorites. Uh, but again, there's no superiority to any one of them. Um, it's just whatever works for you. Uh, I I love the idea of um, every time that you have like a, a break in your day, like going to the washroom or like having to wash your hands or something, doing like like a small exercise. I think that seems really attainable. Uh, I was very into going to the gym for a while. Then recently I've been feeling more tired, like how you were talking about. And uh, it is definitely a lot more attainable to do like a small exercise for a couple of minutes multiple times throughout the day. Yeah, and that's a great point that I want to kind of uh, reinforce. Um, ironically, even though it's not structured exercise, this could actually build strength faster than a dedicated strength training program. Uh, there's a concept. Uh, there's there's um, a concept called frequent, fresh, and flawless. It's the three Fs. That's how you build super strength. Um, and so, frequent means you do it several times throughout the day. Fresh and flawless it means you don't take it to fatigue. So you don't do it the way you might do it in the gym, where you chase the like the the burn. Here, you, you stay far away from muscular failure, and you think of this movement not as strength training, but as, as practice. I'm practicing this movement. Um, and a lot of people have used this method to get very, very strong without a gym, and often stronger than people in a gym, uh, because you can do it multiple times a day. From a learning perspective, 
um, even not, not just a learn, learning a physical skill, just from a learning in general, frequency is the key, not intensity, okay? Um, and so if you combine frequency and the right intensity, you get even better results. Uh, and so that's why as is always things like doing exercises throughout the day, but not going to failure, that can actually go a really long way in terms of improving strength. How does that um, correlate with fat loss? Um, that it, it gets a lot more complicated when we talk about fat loss because with strength, there's really only one factor and that's, or a couple factors. Uh, one, the actual size of the muscle, but two, a very underrated um, aspect of strength is the efficiency of the nervous system. Uh, when it comes to fat loss, it's just a single variable, but there's another variable, which is, well, your nutrition. What if you do these exercises and in general, they don't burn a heck of a lot of calories. Um, you, uh, I mean, how long does it take to do 10 squats? Like 20 to 40 seconds. You don't burn a lot of calories in 20 to 40 seconds. Now, even if you do that many times throughout, like 10 times throughout the day, that's less than 10 minutes. Um, so does it have a huge effect on fat loss? No. Uh, might it have a small effect on fat loss? Maybe. But the biggest effect on fat loss is nutrition. Mm -hmm. Maybe you do these exercises and you get a little hungrier. So you compensate for them and then you overcompensate for them. Uh, or maybe they don't make you hungrier. So that, that's where it's, uh, we, we like to think of the body as a neat organized system, but it isn't. We think if we eat this way and we start exercising, our calories go higher. Well, maybe our, when we get hungrier and our appetite goes up and so we go up or maybe we match it, right? So we think of this, uh, our body's a nice, neat little system, but it's not. Um, it, like some people can exercise and that's alone to make them lose body fat. Other people can exercise and they get hungrier than what they burned. So mm -hmm. it's not, and that, that's where there's the art and the science of fat loss. Cause it's not just, you know, here's what works, but there's many things that work and it's more than one thing. Gotcha. Um, I, I do have one final question, but I, I, Laura, if you have any questions, if anyone else has questions, please take priority. I've asked a couple at this point. No problem. This is fun for me. <laughs> I think you're good to go. Yeah. Go on. Um, okay. So as far as cutting and bulking, do you suggest that? I know that that's definitely more of something that people who are like very dedicated to a regimen will do. Um, it's a little bit rarer to see, but I mean, how do you, what are your thoughts on it? Um, for, for general health, I, I don't think it's necessary. It's not harmful per se, but not necessary. Um, if you want to step on stage in a bikini or in swimming trunks and get judged by judges, then yeah, that's, that's what you do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. I wasn't ever sure if it was, um, like, like interval training, but for your whole body, you know, how like that will like, uh, improve your, gosh, I'm blanking, but, um, yeah. Well, no, it's not quite like interval training. It's more like phases. Um, mm -hmm. So cutting means it's a, it's a fat loss phase until you get to a certain percent of body fat. For women, it's usually somewhere between nine and fourteen percent body fat. For men, it's like between three and seven percent body fat. So you cut, and then you bulk. Bulk means you you gain muscle, mm -hmm. but in like fat gain while, while you're gaining muscle is almost inevitable unless somebody's a steroid user. Um, and so it's so because of that came you know cutting and bulking phases. Um, but, and so, if, so, and if, again, if somebody wants maximum muscle, um, then that's a potential way to go for the vast majority of people who don't want maximum muscle. Maybe they just want a little more muscle than what they currently have. It's not really necessary. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. That, yeah. that was, that was a great explanation. Yeah. Good. Okay. I could go on. If there's other questions I'm happy to answer. <laughs> All right, last chance to ask Igor his questions on this platform. Does anybody have any other questions? I'll say going once. <laughs> All right, well, I, I just wanna thank everybody who attended this session uh, this evening. It was extremely informative. Thank you so much, Igor, for being here. And My for pleasure. helping us um, understand how to become more healthy professional individuals with our managing our stress. And um, I'll definitely be taking a few of those things into consideration because um, there's definitely days where I can use some breathing techniques and some other things too. So Happy thank you. Again. <laughs> thank you. Um, and if, if people have questions after the fact, is it okay if we forward them your way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'll, I'll put in my email address in the chat box right now. So it's okay, at torontofitnessonline.com. There you go. All right. Well, that's a wrap, everyone. Thank you again for joining us for this Think Innovate mini session. Um, we'll talk to you soon. Have a nice night. Bye, everyone.